guys, um, welcome to my third discussion concept video for this semester. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Gibbs free energy um, and how that relates to other like major thermodynamic concepts uh, like entropy and stability. Um, and we're going to try to connect those things with what we've already seen before, um, the concepts from extremophiles and uh, enzyme kinetics. And then we're going to try to bridge um, bridge these concepts with the things that are coming up in this course. So our next big um, chunk of curriculum is going to be talking a lot about cell metabolism, um, which can be a hefty beast. So I really want to make sure that we um, understand the underlying concepts um, and are able to apply these thermodynamic concepts across the like, different biological applications. So you'll kind of see what I mean in a little bit. But so first, what I'm going to do is um, go through some slides and a lot of this beginning stuff um, should hopefully be review, um, but just to really kind of ingrain these patterns into your head um, to allow for a better understanding of um, glycolysis and a lot of these cycles that we're going to be learning later on. So first, I want to just show this um, this graph, which is the which is a graph of the Gibbs free energy. Um, this is the graph that we have looked at before um, in regards to enzyme kinetics. So it should look familiar to you. Um, the main points that I want you guys to make sure that you know um, from this graph, firstly, how to determine whether or not a, or like whether a reaction is exergonic or endergonic from this chart. Um, that should be like a key thing that you know how to do just by looking at this. Um, you should also know which reactions are going to occur spontaneously versus not, and then how that relates to coupled reactions. And then lastly, um, being able to look at uh, like the reactants and the products and knowing whether or not it's exergonic or endergonic and this like spontaneous uh, nature of that, be able to tell me like relative amounts of free energy, stability, and entropy. So remember that these concepts, all of these concepts of free energy are all relative. So kind of like the hypertonicity that we talked about, um, how if you're, you're describing something as hypertonic or hypotonic, it only really has meaning when you're describing it in comparison to something else. The same thing is true here. If we were just looking at this reactants portion and we were trying to say like, is this, does this have high free energy? It wouldn't really mean anything because everything that we interpret on this graph is all about like net change. So like we're looking, okay, what is the difference between the reactants and the products? And that's gonna tell us whether or not we have um, the stability and entropy and whatever um, that we're looking for. So yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because like imagine if this products um, line over here, if this actually like was way up here, we would have that positive um, delta G and that would change all of our analysis. So that's why we, we always want to um, make sure that we're like comparing something to another when we're describing it this way. Um, so just to just to review, um, the way that you determine exergonic versus endergonic based on just this chart is just the delta G alone. And some people get confused because of this activation energy part. So just remember when you're trying to look at exergonic or endergonic, you're looking at the net change um, between the reactants and products. So technically we could have a reaction where we have a huge activation energy hump like way up here. But if it goes down to this same level or any level that's lower than what it started with, it's still going to be classified as an exergonic reaction and also a spontaneous reaction. So spontaneous is like a word that has kind of a different meaning in biology than how we use it colloquially. So spontaneously in this context does not mean instantaneous by any means. Um, it really means that it will like potentially, it's potentially able to occur without us adding an extra energy input. Like we don't have to supply something with ATP in order for it to happen theoretically. If in real life we did have this reaction where like this activation energy was super high, we would probably not see that reaction occur on any sort of meaningful time scale. So like if we think about um, the things that we rely on enzymes for the most, like, like digestion and stuff, where that has to kind of occur relatively quickly if we're trying to get energy from food, um, we need to digest that into like its component parts. Um, so in reality, we might not see these reactions very much, but they still are technically exergonic and therefore can occur because um, if we gave them enough time, if we had like unlimited time to watch this, um, they would eventually occur. Um, the reason why spontaneity and coupling 
is so linked is ultimately due to um, thermodynamics. So we learned in lecture that all reactions that occur in nature have to be exergonic. There has to be this energy being released. And I'll explain a little bit more why, but it all has to do with like state stability and entropy. So just hold on, hold off on that for a second and I will explain um, a little bit in more detail. But so we know that we're always gonna have to release energy. And the problem with that is when we're trying to build structures like enzymes or proteins or like specialized, special, specialized structures in our cells, those will really very often will require um, uh, endergonic reactions. So if this is like key to our survival and our like differentiation as species, um, how in the world did this happen? And coupling is the answer. So essentially, um, we can kind of trick nature um, because anything that we want to do that's endergonic, we just have to make sure that we're coupling that with a reaction that is more negative than the reaction that you want to happen so that you still end up with this negative delta G. So we can add anything we want as long as it, um, as it like works and it's more negative uh, than the endergonic reaction, then that reaction will be able to become a spontaneous exergonic reaction, like as a net whole. So that's why it's important. Um, it allows us to create all these like cool specialized cells and stuff, uh, or specialized structures. Um, so looking at this next page, this is kind of an overview of what I just talked about, about the patterns. And so try not to just memorize these and take that into the exam, like really try to um, understand the concepts behind this, but I did want to have like one cohesive place where you could, could see it all at once. Um, but okay, so we know that uh, in an exergonic reaction or like in a spontaneous reaction, we're always going to be going from this high free energy to low free energy. And if you remember what free energy is, um, the definition is the capacity for work to be done on the object. So it's related to potential energy uh, very closely. I think we've, we've used the words potential energy kind of interchangeably with free energy so far. Um, there are a little bit of differences. They're kind of nitpicky and they're beyond the scope of this course. Um, but just to explain, because it, it might be something that you're interested in or that comes up later on in a different class. Um, but essentially potential energy, it is kind of an umbrella term for like all the different types of um, potentials, like potential energy that you could have. Um, but in reality, like in the field, you're going to see that Potential energy is almost always used to describe potential energy relating to position. So this is most commonly like gravitational potential energy. So when we, when we think of um, like common analogies that are used for describing potential energy, you can probably think of like someone on top of a diving board or a cliff um, versus at the bottom. And so like a lot of these use that um, gravitational um, potential energy as kind of a way to, to conceptualize um, what we talk about when we talk about potential. Um, so Gibbs free energy energy is kind of a subset of that where instead of talking about gravity, we're talking specifically about chemical interactions with each other. Um, and then, so technically there's even, so we kind of have potential energy and then we have free energy and then there's even more of a subset. So we have Gibbs free energy, which is what we're using here. Gibbs free energy has the set of assumptions that is kind of tailored towards most common scenarios that you'll see in like biological applications. So like lots of like scientists and like STEM researchers and stuff will use this um, type of free energy equation. Um, and that just has a, like a set of assumptions that says, okay, we are assuming that this reaction is occurring under a standard pressure. Um, so like hundred kilopascals or one ATM. Um, standard temperature, 25 cells. Um, and what was the other one? pH, pH of seven, neutral pH. And so those are the, the standard assumptions. And if you deviate from those assumptions, if you violate them, you're gonna have to like adjust your calculation to account for that. Um, the other type is called the Helmholtz uh, free energy. And this is what's commonly used in like physics and engineering and stuff like that. They have a different set of assumptions. And like one of the main differences is um, they don't assume that the pressure is constant, which is just interesting because um, like if you think about like their applications versus ours, they're gonna have experiences with like designing structures that can like withstand different amounts of pressure, like bridges or like building bombs or something. Like they're gonna have a lot more applications where that 
um, dynamic pressure is gonna is gonna be more pre prevalent than um, than in our case. So that's why we have different equations. And so you don't have to know any of this part that I started talking about from the difference um, the differences between the types of free energies. But it's just interesting because like if you are an engineer or a, um, like in a physics class or something, and you you see an equation for free energy. Um, the, the formula might be different and that's this is like the reason why and it's also just to kind of give you guys a sense of like how potential energy and free energy relate because I don't think we explain the difference very well um, and so yeah for the scope of this course they're essentially inter interchangeable um, okay so going back to our regular topic we have this high free energy which means that we have the greater work to be done it's going to be more ordered which means that there's lower entropy levels this is what we're starting off with. And then it's going to be less stable. And so I'm going to explain why in a second. So just remember this. Okay. And then we're going to this lower free energy, um, which is going to be more stable. It's going to have less capacity for work to be done. And it's going to be more disordered. So it's going to have higher entropy levels. So overall, this is consistent with the second law of thermodynamics, where it says that any system um, will have to have an overall increase in entropy. Um, I think the biggest point of confusion that I can sort of glean um, from free energy stuff is this unique relationship between order and stability. And I think that's because um, colloquially or like kind of in our everyday life, we generally associate order with like being a little bit more stable. Um, just kind of like in um, almost any other context, we, we assume that something that's ordered and neat and tidy um, is, is more stable and like chaotic mess. Um, and so we can see here that that's not the case um, in this context. So trying to wrap your hand, head around why um, and conceptualizing that will help you a long way, especially when you're given a graph like this and have to determine trends um, and stuff like that. Um, being able to assess the underlying mechanisms will be very helpful. So I wanna go back to an example that we've seen before. We've seen this picture before. Um, and I think it's a good indicator, or I, th I think it's a good uh, way of showing how order can be like opposite of stability. So first let's take a look at this hypertonic solution here. Um, if we remember, the extracellular environment is going to be um, more highly concentrated uh, with solute than the intracellular. And next I want us to think about, okay, what does order really mean? Like what does it look like when we see something that's ordered? And I would, I would argue that, so order is essentially non-randomness because order is when you have something that's like distinguishable or there's something distinct about a certain like structure or feature or anything, like any environment that you're talking about. There's something unique about it that makes it organized. So like if you think about um, coming into like your bedroom, what you could do is you could just scatter your clothes any which way always just like have the clothes everywhere or you could have this sense of order where you're going to deliberately pick up the clothes put them on the hanger put them in a dedicated closet that you have like in a specific area of the room now you can see that obviously the second thing is more ordered and it's because the distribution the distribution of the clothes are very deliberate and very focused and it's not random um, if it was random that would be seen as kind of messy um, so this would be like the equivalent of the messy room, this isotonic room. And so now we can start trying to relate this to stability. So we remember when we actually were talking about this in context, um, we said that this situation is bad because when you have this, it's so unstable that the cell will automatically, without any energy input, so just passively, will start ejecting all this water from its cell so that it can neutralize this solution back into an isotonic solution so that these, the intracellular and the extracellular components match each other. Um, and just a reminder that the reason why salt can't come in is because of the like osmosis like barrier. So you can have the solvent um, exit, but you can't have the solute enter. So that's why, that's why it has to do it that way. But that was more for like the actual context of what we were talking about it in. But in terms of conceptualness, like, um, is that a word? I don't know. But in terms of conceptualness, um, we can see that this order obviously has to be um, pretty unstable because it's automatically going to try to get, get back to this equilibrium. 
So this equilibrium, even though it's highly unordered, it's completely, um, it's like a cluttered, messy room with just random stuff strewn about, but it is highly stable. Um, so that's kind of how we can conceptualize this like inverse relationship, even though that typically doesn't make as much sense. Um, we always want to be in equilibrium. And so it's always going to strive for that, even if that means um, becoming less ordered. So that's why the entropy will always uh, increase in a system. Okay, cool. Um, let's move on. So tying it all together, um, I'm not going to like read through this slide because it's essentially just verbalizing what I said. Um, but I think when you're studying, to go back to this slide in particular and look at the things that, um, like at the bullet points, and try to try to explain the mechanism like out loud to yourself, um, or you can like try to just look at half the sentence and complete the sentence based on what you know. Um, these, this is like a good summary slide of the patterns that you'll be expected to um, interpret from, from graphs and stuff. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of do an intermediate tie-in with, um, with concepts that we'll be covering in like the future in this course. Um, so we have this picture here. So you should recognize this first step. We've talked about this before um, in context of acidophiles, how they're able to protect the cell from excess um, acidity by pumping out protons um, that it doesn't want because it'll cause damage. We already talked about this. Um, and what I said in this, in this discussion, which was the, the first discussion, um, I kind of just said, okay, so since we're moving against this gradient, it's gonna require ATP input to power that. And that's kind of the, um, the extent to which I described how that's active transport. So now we're going a little bit more in depth. So like, why does ATP allow that to happen? Like what's actually occurring here? So thinking about that, um, okay, we know that any reaction that happens in real life has to be net exergonic. And right now we know, okay, if we're moving a proton from this, um, this environment to this environment, we're moving against a gradient, which is going to violate the laws of thermodynamics um, because we're going, we're going to be um, like going in the opposite direction. We're going to be making this more unstable. So in order to make this happen, because we want this to happen, um, like as cells, we're like, we want to be protected from these acids, so we want this out of here. So the way that we can do that is we can like trick mother nature by adding this exergonic reaction to that so that you still get this net exergonic, which will allow this to happen. And so ATP is like probably the most common example of like um, a reaction that can power, that can like offer that energy for the endergonic reactions um, in cells. And so if we remember um, like why, kind of like what is actually happening here. So we have this ATP um, and it's being uh, dephosphorylated into the ADP and the phosphate group. Um, and that process is going to, is going to result in a like net delta G of about like negative 7.3, um, which is pretty strong, like when we're talking about like relative to other things. Um, so that's why it's so universal. Um, in organisms, like ATP is like a really common uh, like source of energy. And that's why it's because it's so able to power this endergonic reaction. Uh, okay, so that's this first part. This is the part we've already talked about. And now the part that I'm kind of like moving into new material for is um, this whole concept of secondary active transport. So secondary active transport involves another protein uh, transport protein. Oh, also I should probably mention this is, so this proton pump is technically called a uniport. Uniports are anything that accepts a specific substrate and pumps it in one direction. So here we can see, okay, we accept protons and we pump it out. We're not pumping it back in and we're not accepting other stuff here. Um, the next step will actually be utilizing a symport. Symport is when you take two different types of substrates and technically when you use the word symport, one of them it has to be a proton, um, but I don't know if that necessarily matters. Um, but yeah, so you accept two substrates and um, both going in the same direction. So that's the difference between those two. Uh, and that will, you'll, we'll be able to see how that's relevant in just a second. Um, okay, so we have this new environment. So we just pumped out this proton into this extracellular space. And now we're going to utilize what we know about what just happened there to power something that wouldn't normally 
that wouldn't normally happen in another way. So if you remember, um, okay, so this is a active transport, which means that it's going against its gradient. And since we're going against its gradient, we're going towards an environment that's less stable. And if we remember, what are the less stable, like what are some characteristics of the less stable um, like environments in an interaction? Um, they're going to be highly ordered, which we can see because there's a systematic difference between the, between the extracellular and intracellular. Um, and it is also going to be very unstable. It's going to be like agitated. It doesn't want to go against the gradient. Nature is saying we got to neutralize everything. So go back. Um, so it's going to really agitate that environment. And why that's useful? Well, first I'll describe kind of how it agitates and what I mean by that. Um, so we can see here clearly. So as I was talking about like hypertonic solutions and stuff, the gradient that we were referring to is a, is called a concentration gradient, um, or it can also be called a chemical gradient. And that's just because that's just like when you have this difference in solute concentrations um, across like either a membrane or like in two different environments that you're comparing. Um, so that's an important thing that has its own effect. But then also we see that these protons are charged. So not only do we have this difference in solute concentration, we're also pulling the charges um, onto one side of the membrane. Like all the positive charges are now going to be located right on this extracellular portion. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause all the negative charges from inside the membrane to be attracted like really close. So like on the other side of the membrane. And the reason why is because neutralization wants to happen so bad. Nature's always like, I want to be neutralized. And so it's going to cause these charges to get really close to each other, but not be able to neutralize. So we are going to have this charge alongside the membranes. And the reason why that is important is because that's another, so like now we've set up another type of gradient um, just by using this one thing. We have a concentration gradient and a chemical gradient, or a concentration gradient and an electrical uh, gradient, which we call an electrochemical gradient. So that's like the most strong like form of gradient that you can have. So we now we have that set up, and this, this, or this environment out here is like really agitated, um, all that potential energy kind of bubbling about. And so we utilize that um, with the aid of this uh, symport. So since this is allowed to take a, a proton, that's one of the substrates um, it allows, since there's so much energy out here, what it can do is it can pull along another substrate that would not normally diffuse into the cell. So like if you think about, okay, why can't sucrose come in on its own? Well, if you try to think like structurally, okay, like what advantage and stability would adding like sucrose cause to the cell? It's like not going to stabilize anything. Like there's going to be no incentive or like push for like nature to want this to happen um, spontaneously. So that's why this is an endergonic reaction and that's why it's not going to occur normally. Um, but when we have that agitation, that agitation state where we have all that energy nearby and we can pull this along, um, this transporter, then this is able to get into the cell without even an, another addition of ATP at this step. So that's why it's called secondary active transport. So in secondary active transport, you have, you have this initial ATP input that sets up the gradient, and the gradient is what then is used to power a different reaction. So if you like just look at the, the influx of sucrose, you're not gonna see any ATP. It could kind of almost look passive if you like didn't know what was like the context of what was going on. Um, but it is still a type of active transport because of this initial influx that was, was required to make it happen. Um, and this is also called um, co-transport or indirect active transport. So if you hear any of those terms, um, that's what this means. Um, so try not to be confused by that. But yeah, it's anything where like the, the cause of the passive transport required an active input. That's a form of like secondary transport. Okay, so I hope that made sense. Um, now I'm going to knowledge check um, to see if you can kind of apply these concepts to another example um, that we haven't talked about yet. Um, so like, let's compare an amino acid to a protein. So like, we're comparing these two things relative to each other. And now we have to try to describe um, like the characteristics that we would from on a free energy graph. So we can think, okay, which one has the higher amount of free energy relative to each other, which is more stable, which has a higher level of disorder, so higher level of entropy, 
And using those, using our knowledge from what we said for those, um, we would be able to determine, okay, is creating peptide bonds going to be exergonic or endergonic? And then what effect does that have? Like what implication does that have for what we need to do? Like, do we need to couple it with something? Will it occur naturally, spontaneously? Um, like what are the further implications of that? And then just being able to explain all the mechanisms why. So what I would do right now is pause this video and try to um, either just think about it in your head or even better would be to write it down, like sketch a little bit and try to uh, think about like what's actually going on. And then you can resume this video. So, okay. Now we are resuming. I'm assuming that you took a little second to, to do this. Um, so we're comparing amino acids to a protein. Um, first thing that we want to determine is which one has the higher free energy. So we're trying to think, okay, which one has more of an ability to do work to somehow change its structure that will like allow something to happen. So one example that for some reason I like really like, I don't know why, is um, imagining, so like imagine that you're at a top of a diving board and you're holding a penny and you want to somehow get the penny to the bottom of the pool. There are a lot of ways that you could go about doing that, right? You could kind of like flick it like this and like make it like spin in the air and do it. You could um, chuck it with your arm. You could just like hold your hand out and drop it like this. There are like a lot of different ways that you can get to this, um, to this same like result of a really highly stable state, which would be at the bottom of the pool. And now at this point, there's really nothing um, that you could do to kind of like change what's going on with it without adding like a completely separate reaction. Um, so that's kind of how I think of like free energy in general. So now let's, let's bring it back to this example. So an amino acid versus a protein. Um, pr amino acid, how much stuff can we do to that that will like allow um, like shapes and structures and like all these interactions to change, especially compared to a protein? Um, it should hopefully be pretty obvious. Um, we know that an amino acid is a building block. It's like a, it's an essential building block of these proteins, um, of proteins in general. And so when we have a protein, um, if you can recall, there's the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. So this is a lot of options for us to be able to kind of intervene for work to be done. Um, at the quaternary level, what we could do is interrupt those polypeptide chains from linking with each other. The tertiary level, we could uh, disrupt the interactions between the regions of each polypeptide chain. So those um, alpha helices and uh, beta like pleated sheets, um, messing with the interactions between those on one polypeptide chain. Um, at the secondary level, we could interrupt the hydrogen bonds that are causing those shapes to begin with, those alpha helices and um, beta sheets. And then at the primary level, we can disrupt these bonds between um, the different amino acids that are linked together. So clearly, like it's pretty obvious now that proteins are going to have way more potential work that can be done to it. So that's the answer to the first one. And so now remember, okay, when we said that something has higher free energy, what, is it, what does that tell us about stability? Hopefully you remember that it's um, less. So we, we're always trying to move nature in a, in a direction towards more stability. And when you have all of this potential to do, to do things, um, that makes something a little bit more unstable. Like if you think at the top of the diving board, there's a lot of things that like could maybe go wrong um, or like different routes and options that you could take. Whereas at the bottom of the pool, you're just sitting there. Um, like the penny's just sitting there. There's not much that can be done. So it's relatively like stable um, in comparison. And then disorder. So this is like entropy. Um, like remembering the relationships that we talked about previously. If we have that low level of stability, that high level of free energy. What that tells us about disorder is that the disorder is actually going to be relatively like low. It's going to be, it's going to be more ordered. And this is where kind of like the, the analogy with the penny and the diving board kind of falls apart. But if you think about like this protein versus the amino acid, um, if we remember our, how we defined order or how I defined it earlier was non-randomness. So there's some sort of um, systematic difference in how something is organized compared to like just a random distribution. And so when we think about a protein structure, think about all the different levels, the protein or the amino acid chains, the, um, the pleated sheets, the different regions, the, and then the quaternary structure of these different polypeptide links together. 
all of these things are highly, highly ordered. How that actually ends up looking in real life is completely 100% based on the structure because of like the bonds that are interacting with each other. All of those interactions are what's causing this particular shape to arise. And so that means that this um, particular conformation of each protein is super ordered and like deliberate. Um, and so essentially we're trying to figure out, okay, does creating a protein from these amino acids, like going in that direction, amino acids to a protein, is that gonna be exergonic or enderg endergonic? Hopefully you were able to tell that this would be an endergonic reaction. And the way that you can conceptualize this is, okay, you're going from this amino acid, which is a building block. Um, it's highly stable. There's not much work that can be done on it um, because it's already kind of at its building block level. Um, so it has that, that low level of free energy. It's already kind of like where it wants to be, chilling. And now when we're trying to make these bonds between these amino acids to create this protein, which is highly ordered because remember that all the levels of structure that proteins have, they're so specific and they're so deliberate and ordered like based on, um, based on like the, the interactions between like everything <laughs> in the protein. Um, how do we get that to happen? Uh, we obviously will have to couple this reaction with other things um, in order to make this possible because we can, because hopefully it should be obvious by now that this is gonna be an endergonic reaction on its own. So now we know, like the implications of this is that we are gonna have to couple it. Um, and this is why when we're thinking of like growth and development and things like that, um, we think of like, uh, like growing children or like teenagers, whatever, they need a lot of energy, um, like increased food intake compared to like elderly people, for example. And all of that energy is being used to support this, these like types of um, reactions where you're building these complex structures that could not happen without that energy. Okay, so now we're gonna move this even further along to um, the concepts that we're gonna be talking about in like the next several weeks. Um, so the reason why I'm like super adamant about doing this, um, like making this application super clear, is that when you move on to biochem and other classes, this is what a metabolic cell map looks like in a single cell. Um, and you will be responsible for learning these and like remembering these pathways and being able to like recite what the um, intermediates are, the intermediate, intermediate metabolites are and like also like which, which ones are um, exergonic versus endergonic and why and how that possibly evolved, all of these things. So in order to kind of save you some sanity later on, um, I don't want you to have to memorize all of these while also trying to figure out why things are happening. Um, now what we can do is just try to really nail down these concepts already so that when you see these, um, it should be a little bit more like second nature about like, okay, why is this happening? And how could this have possibly evolved over time to like do this. Um, and essentially it all boils down to the thermodynamics and free energy patterns. Um, but so just like getting that to be second nature is gonna be key. Okay, so this part I screenshotted from the, the first question, the first part of the first question of the discussion worksheet or the discussion exercise, sorry, it's technically a PowerPoint for a minute. Um, discussion exercise that's on Canvas. I screenshotted it here because I wanted to talk about it. Um, so it says, during the payoff phase of glycolysis, ATP is synthesized by substrate level of phosphorylation. And then we're given what this reaction is, this um, phosphoenol pyruvate, which is also, it's like more commonly abbreviated as PEP or PEP. So if you see that, it's the same thing. Um, plus ADP. And then we are uh, catalyzing the reaction where we have pyruvate and ATP as our products. Now, um, one big hint that I will give you since we haven't really talked about glycolysis in lecture until like today, um, you could answer this question without any knowledge about what the payoff phase means, what glycolysis is, um, what substrate phos level phosphorylation is. You could answer that without any of these. Um, and the reason why, like maybe you should try to think, okay, kind of brainstorm, like why do you not need to know any of that information in order to be able to tell me whether this is exergonic or endergonic? If you thought about it for a second, um, this reaction has to be exergonic. Any reaction that happens in real life is going to 
have to be exergonic in order to uh, maintain the laws of thermodynamics, which we all do. So any reaction that we're saying is occurring, and you can assume that we're not deliberately lying to you, um, we're going to be able to say with confidence that it's going to be an exer exergonic reaction. And so this is actually a case where it might be good to have less background knowledge um, on what's going on, because I think when you see this, if you um, pick up on the fact like, okay, we have ADP here, and we're making ATP, um, what would this be? Well, first of all, this is condensation. You're making like an ATP, um, like a rise from this ADP, um, which is different than hydrolysis, which is the opposite direction. So just remembering that. Um, we might be very tempted to say that this is going to be endergonic because of that ATP formation. And if this is almost any other mechanism, that like might be a fair assumption because we, we know already that when we, um, when we break down ATP, when we have ATP to ADP, that's highly exergonic. So in the, in the other direction, um, the ADP to ATP, we can presume, is going to be highly endergonic. But remember, okay, so we are coupled with this other reaction. And we're telling you that this reaction is happening in real life. This reaction, the reaction that it's coupled to, has to be even more exergonic than the other reaction is endergonic. You have to, when you um, are subtracting them from each other, you have to make sure that you're going to get a net negative. So if I told you that ATP to ADP is negative 7.3, this way is going to be seven, positive 7.3. So this direction, we know is going to have to be negative because it has to be a net negative, and it has to be um, more negative than 7.3, like than negative 7.3. Okay, so moving on a little bit, I'm going to try to talk about a glycolysis, um, just like a brief overview, um, so that we can start kind of picturing what's actually happening um, instead of just using our knowledge of thermodynamics to guess what's happening. So glycolysis is essentially in three different phases. Um, and the thing that links them is that they, it kind of takes us from the very beginning of a metabolic process to an end result that we want. So the phase one, we're taking a glucose molecule, um, which presumably we're getting from food, and then all the way to the end of glycolysis, which is the production of a, like a, net, a net gain of extra ATP. And so that is what links these three processes. But each of these three phases have reactions of their own that they're undergoing. So I don't want you to get confused with like coupled reactions. Like when you see a coupled reaction, um, it's gonna be like the reactions in phase one, in phase two, in phase three. Um, just because we're like, I'll show you, it'll make a little bit more sense when I show it. But um, so phase one is called the investment phase. Um, and it kind of, should hopefully like, make sense why we call it that in a second. Um, it requires an active input of two ATP in order to get this process going. So we do have to, we have to do something first to make that happen. And so what that tells us is that because we need that active, um, that active input to push this reaction forward, without even knowing at first, um, like before I tell you, you'll know that the other reaction that's coupled with it has to, is probably gonna be like an endergonic reaction because it needed that coupling with ATP in order to function. And since we're, as, since like a metabolic process is trying to create ATP, we wouldn't just be like putting ATP in for no reason if we didn't need to. So like this is an interesting example of like how coupling is like an example of like we are just evolving what we can do to make this reaction happen. So we have this initial investment of two ATP and the endergonic that we're trying to do is we're trying to add two phosphate groups to glucose. So you can try to think about, okay, knowing what we knew about um, how things can be classified as endergonic versus exergonic, what are the, the characteristics of this that would cause this to be an endergonic reaction? So we remember um, if it's endergonic, we're moving to a, a period, like to a, an environment of um, less disorder, so a more ordered, uh, we're moving to less stable into a higher free energy. So try to think like what about these, the addition of these phosphate groups to this glucose would, would create these characteristics because that's what's gonna, because that is ultimately what determines whether it's gonna be endergonic or not. 
Um, okay, so phase two is an intermediate phase where we're just taking the metabolites from what we get in phase one and then bringing it to phase three. Um, so we don't need to worry about that part right now. We're just kind of concerned about like the beginning and the end. Um, so phase three is the payoff phase, which obviously we wanted to get to because that's the whole point of us um, evolving this pathway. Payoff phase, we have a net gain of ATP. So you remember we put in two in the hydrolysis part or in the, we put two in the investment part. And then now we are gaining four uh, from this payoff phase or whatever. And so the four ATPs are being produced by a condensation reaction. So you remember we are taking um, this like ADP original and converting that into ATP. Um, and it's gonna have to be coupled with an exergonic reaction in order to occur. So the exergonic reaction that it's coupled to is this reaction from before. So before we were talking about the payoff phase, I just didn't explain what that meant or where we were like located in the cycle. Um, but this is the, the reaction. So this is the um, condensation reaction of the ADP, or yeah, condensation reaction to form ATP. And so what we know about this, we, we said already, without even any knowledge about this, that this entire reaction is going to be exergonic. So it's going to be a net negative. And since we know um, that this is going to be highly endergonic, we know that this is going to be, have to be even more dramatically exergonic in order to make, to make that happen. So I already explained that, but just to kind of reiterate again um, what's happening there. Okay, and they're actually, yeah, they're, you don't really have to know the structural reason about why this, um, this reaction is so strong, but essentially it has to do with the enol group. So it's because this phosphate group, when it's attached um, here, it traps this molecule in a, real, like a very highly unstable um, enol form. So when we think about that, we, it's highly unstable. So it's going to be, have lots of uh, free energy. It's going to really be wanting to push to this equilibrium state. Um, and then when we ca uh, catalyze this reaction, we have pyruvate, which is far more stable, uh, much less free energy. And so that's our exergonic reaction of energy being released. And we're going, um, like we're following nature's wishes towards a period of more st uh, stability and more equilibrium. So that's why this is able to outweigh this other reaction, but you don't really need to know why. Like you don't necessarily need to know the mechanism of that. Um, okay. So just another kind of summary slide. Um, remember, so for a glycolysis, what we put in was this two ATP, this one glucose, and then I didn't talk about this, but it is part of the process, the one NAD, uh, NAD plus. What we get out is this four ATP, so this net gain of two ATP two pyruvate and one NADH. And so the reason why this evolved um, probably like in this particular way is because not only do we get this net gain of two ATP, which is really important, we also get the, this pyruvate and NADH, uh, which are really important for like the next cycles that our cells are gonna go like undergo. Um, so NADH is an electron carrier um, and pyruvates are gonna enter another cycle that we'll talk about in probably a couple weeks. Um, so that's why I feel like glycolysis is so cool. <laughs> I just like really am a fan of glycolysis. Um, it's able to turn this like one glucose molecule, which is really abundant in our environment, like all over the place. And it's able to turn that into like three different types of molecules that are so important for energy creation. Um, and it does it in a way that like, even though you require some energy input to get it started, you're ultimately, you're getting this net positive effect. Um, and obviously this is like super necessary because if we, if we think about, okay, remember what those endergonic reactions are, it's creating that, um, those highly ordered structures. And so those are the things that are going to be highly specialized and highly, um, like important and like the ability to engage in repair and growth and transport and signaling and all these things, um, they require these endergonic reactions. So the ability of glycolysis to, to do this is really, really cool to me. Um, and also, it's interesting because it is an anaerobic process and it's super highly conserved throughout the tree of life. So like we can um, go back and like try to observe um, the like similarities between different life forms. 
And by seeing how well conserved glycolysis is, we can kind of have an estimate about how old it is. And glycolysis is like the oldest metabolic, like advanced metal, metabolic um, system that we know of. So like even before aerobic uh, bacteria arrived, like on this earth, um, glycolysis is happening, which is just like awesome. Okay, so next slide. Um, this one is the second part of the worksheet or the discussion exercise um, that was posted. So now we're given a little bit more information. Um, well, on this part, I actually already gave you anyway, but so essentially we're being told, okay, now we have a specific number attached to this. We already know that this overall reaction is going to be negative. So we can put a negative sign here already. Um, and now we're told, okay, ATP hydrolysis, so taking ATP, ADP to form ATP, is going to have this um, delta G of negative 7.3. So I already talked about this, but if, you, if I hadn't, what you would do is you would say, okay, so this is hydrolysis, um, and what we're talking about, or like what we're trying to find is um, condensation. So it's essentially the same reaction in reverse, so all that means is that you have to change the sign. So we know here for sure this ATP production part is going to have a delta G of positive 7.3 kilocals per mole. Um, we still, okay, we still know that the overall reaction is negative. Then we look at the pyruvate production. And what can we say about it? We can, we can use what we know so far um, to kind of estimate a range. And you should remember it like this is, it just has to be more negative than this has to be positive. So we know for sure that this is 7.3. We were good in that. So this has to be any number that's um, more negative than 7.3. Okay. And if I was to tell you, if I was to give you some more information, um, if I told you that the overall reaction here is equal to negative 7.8 kilocals per mole, you should try on your own to figure out the actual number of this pyruvate production. Because now we have the the number, the official numbers for this and this, which should tell you um, what this is. And we already know that this is going to be a negative number, like more negative than 7.3. So we can we can kind of verify our answers when you do your calculation. Okay, that was a lot. <laughs> um, bear with me, or just split this up into multiple um, multiple viewings. But I really want to go over the worksheet answers because that's also important. Okay, so now we're looking at this worksheet, um, and we are asked to look at this, um, this change, this before and after condition, and indicate if the delta G of that reaction would be um, positive or negative, and why. So looking at it, okay, we have this proton that's in this intracellular environment. We can see that there's a highly ordered condition where there's the, all these protons and charges outside of the cell. And right now it's on the inside. Now, it, and so now it has contributed to that extra, like the reservoir of potential energy, because it's just contributing to that, um, to that agitation. We're going against a gradient. We're going against nature's wishes to um, just become more stable and to become like, like have a greater equilibrium between the different sides. Um, so what this tells us is that this has to be a endergonic reaction because we're going against what like nature alone would tell us to do. Um, so the thing that's kind of missing from this chart, um, because that would kind of give the answer away, is that this, in order for this to happen, this would have to be coupled with a different reaction that was exergonic. So this wouldn't be able to randomly, like passively diffuse on its own. This is gonna have to be coupled to a exergonic reaction in order for it to occur. So I don't want you to be confused by that. Um, but like looking at, okay, in the intracellular environment, what is the level of free energy here compared to here? And hopefully you can guess. So free energy is um, obviously like that ability to do work. So when we're here in this highly stable um, kind of chill environment where nothing's really happening to this, this proton um, on its own, we're gonna have a pretty like low level of free energy. It's like where it wants to be right now. But when we have this endothermic reaction that we're coupling in order to make this happen, we're going against this gradient and suddenly we're contributing to that, um, to that source of free energy. So we know that we're gonna have a lot of free energy at this point. So this is the answer. Okay, 
So the next one is a little bit more tricky. Um, it says, let's consider part one of a uniport reaction. Assume that the ATP coupling works by having an intermediate step in which ATP transfers one phosphate to the transporter. Okay, so here we see that, okay, we're having an ATP and a proton pump. And what we're changing is we're taking a phosphate from this ATP and we're putting it to this proton pump to get this ADP and then the proton pump here. So we can say, okay, what step or like what kind of reaction do you think that would be? Would it be negative? Um, delta G negative? And kind of how do you know that? All right, so remember what we said before that in order to follow the laws of thermodynamics, you're always going to have to um, have a negative delta G. If it's happening in real life, um, the net effect of any reaction is going to be a negative delta G. So here, and so we look at these individual steps one by one. So we see, okay, there's this ATP and proton pump. We're donating this proton to the proton pump and creating this ADP. So already we know, okay, this is going to be a highly exergonic reaction. Um, so we already can like know that just based on our background knowledge. And then the second step, this second step can be a little bit trickier. So we have this ADP and the proton pump that's phosphorylated. And we're removing that, and we're removing that group and getting this like end structure of just the proton pump and just the phosphoryl group. We can kind of use our knowledge about um, what we talked about before with the um, like using the free energy graph um, to kind of predict, okay, is this gonna be exergonic or endergonic based on what we know about stability and um, entropy and like those types of things. So, okay, we look at this and it's all relative, right? So we're all just comparing, we're comparing this structure to this structure. We say, okay, this is, compared to this, this structure is more ordered. There's like a deliberate pairing here. There's a reason why this like particular bond occurred. We don't really know about its stability um, at this point, but we do know that the free energy is higher here because there is more work that can be done on it. There's action that can be taken on it to change it. And we see that, that's actually what ends up happening. And then here we just have these essential building blocks basically like we have just this phosphate group and this um this original pump that we had and so it's generally a clue like when you end up with something that's just an essential building block um it's um like that can be a pretty good clue about that reaction is gonna or that's the one that's gonna um like have the lower free energy and stuff it's gonna be the most stable so we know that this reaction too also has to be a uh, negative and the reason why we couldn't know that for sure um, is because even though we know that this entire thing is negative, just based on the fact that it occurs, um, it could be that this step would be positive, but it wouldn't be as positive as this is negative because we are able to see, okay, is it actually, is it just like a weak positive or is it a negative delta G? Okay, and now we're looking at the free energy and we kind of already explored this a little bit. Um, but so we're looking at the, the things together. So both like in this environment, like the net effect of like both of these um, compared at each state, what are the levels of free energy? So when we're looking at the first step, we're thinking, okay, how much work can we do to make stuff happen here? And hopefully it should be obvious, like we're starting a two-step process. So there's obviously things that can be done um, in order to make this happen. This is a highly exergonic reaction, so this is gonna happen naturally. Um, so there's like a lot of potential here. There's like a lot of free energy here. This one, relative to this one, um, we already talked about this, this. So like the AD, ADP is just staying the same at this point. So the change that's occurring here is between this and this. And we already talked about how having these essential like building blocks are gonna be like lower free energy than before. So you're gonna get something like this, where you, you just kind of go down um, the gradient. Okay, now adding an additional portion. So now we are trying to, um, so now at this point, we're adding the additional effects of the coupled reaction. So if you remember, um, like when we were looking at this, this is the, the thing that allows the proton pump to pump against a gradient. So we're looking at just the extragonic portion of the, of the reaction right here. 
And what we want to do is look at the whole thing. Because remember when we were talking about the mechanisms, the whole, the whole point was that we're trying to move this proton over the membrane. And we have to do AT, like we have to use this ATP hydrolysis in order to let that happen. So now like looking at all of this together, now we have to determine um, when looking at this thing as a whole, the coupled reactions as a whole, um, are the steps delta G positive or negative? And then consider why. So remember that the whole thing has to have that net negative like usual. The first step is when we're adding the phosphate group to this proton pump. We're not doing anything with the hydrogen at this step. This is just the ATP. Um, giving that phosphate group to the, to the proton. So it's going to be the same thing as from what we looked at before. And we said this was negative because this is a really common um, exergonic reaction that's used to power endergonic reactions. So we like know that this is going to be um, negative. And then in the second step, so we have this relationship where we're dephosphorylating this proton group and then using this energy to pump it across the membrane. So we have the energy generated from that first step. And then we're doing a further exergonic reaction by dephosphorylating here. So we know that at this point, when we have both of those negatives together and are allowed to pump this H plus across the gradient, that this step also has to be a net negative. Otherwise, that reaction wouldn't be able to occur. OK. Done. Remembering that the reason why we're coupling these reactions together is because we need something that's strong enough to allow this um, endergonic reaction to occur, which means that it has to be net exergonic. So every time you have a net exergonic reaction, you're always going to have that same pattern of the free energy decreasing, because that's what the characteristic of an exergonic reaction is. You're going from that level of high free energy to low free energy. Um, and then you can try to think about how that relates to entropy and stability and stuff. Um, so we can see that even without really like looking at these steps individually at this point, we know based on what's happening, what the purpose of this mechanism is, that we're going to have to have this pattern of decreasing free energy. If we didn't, we would be violating the second law of thermodynamics. So now part five, now consider what happens during oxidative phosphorylation. So it's essentially asking like when we have this um, condensation reaction, this ADP plus phosphate group forming this ATP, what type of reaction is that going to be? Hopefully at this point you're going to immediately, immediately be like, okay, this is going to be endergonic because we know that when we need energy, we break it down. We take ATP and we break it down and that gives us the net negative that we need. And so this should automatically tell us this is going to be positive and we know it's going to be positive 7.3 since we already told you what that value is. Um, when you move from a high proton concentration to a low proton concentration, what is that delta G going to be? Try to think about, okay, what um, free energy levels and like what levels of stability are we like moving when we're moving from a high proton concentration to low proton concentration? Think about it. Um, when we have this high proton con concentration, what it really wants to do is it wants to equilibrate and go back into the cell so that it can be, um, it can kind of like neutralize the charges and the concentration differential. So doing that is going to be a natural process. It's not going to require an extra um, like input of energy to occur because this is what nature is going to do um, like naturally because of the laws of thermodynamics. So we know that this is going to be a negative number. It's going to be exergonic um, and it's going to be a spontaneous reaction. You have to make sure that this coupled reaction is going to give you that net negative delta G. So we know that if this is a positive 7.13, this is going to have to be more negative than that in order to get this coupled reaction to work. So you can see, okay, positive 7.3, more negative than 7.3. Okay, this is a lot. This is all that I had for you. Um, thank you everyone for sticking with me through this kind of long lecture. Um, and sorry if I was a little repetitive, I think it's helpful to hear these things um, like multiple times to kind of let it sink in. Um, if things are still like not making sense to you um, and you need some extra help, I'm happy to provide different analogies or different ways of explaining things because there's a lot of different ways of kind of explaining what's happening here and um, you just kind of need to find one that really clicks with you. Um, so I am happy to work with you to, 
to explore further options, or you can also go to the other GSI's office hours or um, Lori's office hours, and having that, having that different perspective um, might help this click. Um, but hopefully this was helpful in terms of getting you um, a little bit more comfortable with Gibbs Free Energy. Um, exam is coming up, so I really just hope you guys are able to um, focus on focus on these like broad concepts and figuring out why things are happening and kind of using that um, curiosity to help motivate you instead of um, just memorizing things for the sake of the exam, especially in such an accelerated course. I don't want you guys to just forget all this information the second that you walk out and then um, be a little bit upset when you are starting biochem or some other advanced class. So, alrighty, thank you, bye.